Hello, my name is Emma Sagor, and I am the Climate Advisor embedded with the Portland Bureau of Transportation through the American Cities Climate Challenge. This presentation was originally given to the 2040 Freight Stakeholder Advisory Committee in November 2020, and it's really designed to provide a bit of background about the climate crisis, what it means for Portland, and what it means for freight planning looking ahead over the next 20 years. Before I begin, I, I do want to provide a bit of a disclaimer that I am definitely not a freight expert. In fact, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of folks watching this who know a lot more than I do about the latest trends, for example, in freight sustainability or in decarbonization. But I do hope that this helps connect some of the dots between why acting on climate change urgently is so important um, and the role that, that freight and freight planning can play in that. And I also hope it provides some food for thought to inform the development um, of the 2040 freight plan in the coming months. So to kick off, why even talk about the climate crisis in the context of a freight plan or really any transportation plan? Well, put simply, it's because climate change is here. It's happening. We're living through it. Um, we're experiencing those impacts day to day and seeing them with our own eyes, whether that's hearing uh, more and more regular news stories about devastating weather events around the world, to the impacts that hit closer to home. Um, for example, the choking wildfire smoke we all experienced um, in 2020. That's becoming a more regular part of our summers in the Pacific Northwest. And those impacts of the climate crisis, they hit our most vulnerable community members the hardest. Um, and as we'll see in this presentation, when we think about the future livability and sustainability of our communities, we have to be thinking about how we're going to address, um, address the, the challenges that the climate crisis presents. So against that backdrop, we have to ask in all of our long range planning work, no matter if that's on the transportation side, the energy side, housing, what have you, we have to be asking, how will the things in this plan help us mitigate or reduce the impacts of that climate crisis while also helping us adapt to the changing conditions that we're already experiencing and will continue to. So in the next, over the next few minutes, I'll cover the following. I'll first talk about why our climate is changing, a little climate change 101. Um, and then I'll go into what does that mean for our region specifically in 2040, the year that this plan looks to as well as beyond. And then we'll turn to, you know, what can we do about it? What can we do to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of the climate crisis? And then tie it all together at the end with what does that mean specifically for creating an equitable and sustainable 2040 freight master plan? And I'll just acknowledge that this presentation can get a little heavy talking about um, climate change, which is arguably the existential crisis of our time, um, is a really, really deep topic. Um, so I'll try at the end to really end on a solution-oriented note so that we all feel inspired and ready to go um, tackle the climate crisis in, in the ways that we can. Let's start with that climate change or global warming 101. So the atmosphere is really just a thin layer that surrounds our planet, not just, it's a very important thing, but to get a sense of how thin we're talking, the photo on the right on the screen here shows our atmospheric layer from space. And the reason that we can all live and be happy and healthy on Earth is because that atmosphere keeps us perfectly toasty. The sun shines down, it reflects off the Earth, and it creates kind of a nice blanket that, that gives us the right conditions to, to, to sustain life. Now, when humans started extracting fossil fuels and burning them, that released more carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere. And that made that atmospheric blanket feel thicker, kind of like a greenhouse trapping in more heat. And that is why we call them greenhouse gases, because it creates this greenhouse effect that warms the, the Earth's temperature. And that really thin atmospheric layer can fill up super quickly, especially when humans started to admit more and more and more greenhouse gases. So for context, the average Portlander contributes about 49 and a half metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's their carbon footprint, if you will. But what does that really mean? Metric tons are really hard to visualize. Well, I like this visual because it shows that that metric ton of carbon dioxide is about the volume of a standard single family house. So think about each Portlander emitting 50 houses worth of carbon dioxide each year. You can see why that greenhouse effect is getting worse, why that blanket is feeling thicker and thicker around the Earth. And if we look at carbon in the atmosphere historically, you can absolutely see the impacts of humans. Um, 
there's always been some natural fluctuations because we're not the only reason that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are produced. But prior to the Industrial Revolution, the highest previous concentration of carbon dioxide recorded was um, 300 parts per million. But in 2018, you can see that had skyrocketed up to almost 408, a massive increase in really only about 300 years. So what does climate change, or more accurately, the climate crisis, mean for our region? What are we going to experience over the next 20, 30, 50, and 100 years? Well, first, we'll be experiencing more extreme temperatures. Um, so for the past 50 years, you can see a steady increase in our average temperatures here in Portland. That's the graph up on the left. That might not be totally perceptible, right? Like, what's a few degrees on average each year? It's not going to feel like much different. Well, let's think about those really hot days when the temperatures top out over 95 degrees, days that are really dangerous for our houseless populations, for our elderly neighbors who don't have access to air conditioning, and so on. Well, by 2050, we're on track to have almost 20 of those days a year, three whole weeks. And by 2100, which is really not that far away, <laughs> we could be experiencing a month of those temperatures. Now, weather patterns are complicated, so it doesn't mean that we aren't also going to get colder days, even extremely cold days. But the trend toward more extreme heat is already being observed and is set to continue. And in addition to that, those rising temperatures, more of our precipitation is going to be falling as rain rather than snow in the wetter months. You can see up here on the left um, how we and our kind of fellow states in the Pacific Northwest are really going to see that trend towards more rain. So that will reduce the snowpack, which feeds our rivers and streams in our region. The figure on the right shows the projected retreat of snowpack from the Cascades in the Willamette Valley. So you can really see that retreat of the purple area um, from the, the figure on the left to the figure on the right. We're also going to be getting longer times in the summer that where we don't get any precipitation. Um, that combined with dwindling snowpack is going to cause significant water shortages which will affect uh, agriculture, make our land much more dry, and that makes it subject to greater fire risk. And as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, we're already experiencing th this today. Um, and now there are multiple factors that impact the severity of wildfires, including forest management, replanting, and controlled prescribed burning. But drought and higher temperatures caused by climate change definitely make wildfires much more common and likely. In other words, it adds the tinder to the matchbox by making vegetation that much drier while making the overall matchbox a heck of a lot larger because there's just more and more area that's really dry. And as we know, fires don't just cause harm where they burn. The smoke and the poorer air quality associated have huge implications for the health and well-being of our communities. And so while our snowpack will decline and drought and fire will become more common, we're also going to be experiencing uh, rising sea levels around the globe. And this will impact the major waterways um, in our region that are fed by oceans. This map is generated by Climate Central and it shows sea levels we could be seeing at the end of the century in two different scenarios. On the left, that first scenario is what would happen if we kept carbon pollution in check from today's levels, but we don't decrease, we're just staying steady. The one on the right shows what will happen if we keep increasing emissions in an unchecked way, following the historic trends of, of greenhouse gas increase. You'll see that in either scenario, we see big risks to our industrial and port areas alongside the Columbia River, and some risks in downtown Portland. In the unchecked scenario, the entire airport could be under sea level and at risk of severe floods. Climate change also has lots of indirect ecosystem impacts because of how it affects our air and our water systems. So for example, it changes the equilibrium of our oceans, causing harmful phenomenon like algal blooms that can decimate fish populations. It also puts stressors on flora and fauna. Um, animals that aren't able to adapt to changing conditions face um, increased rates of extinction. And we humans also face significant health implications of worsening air quality, rising temperatures, and th those extreme weather events. Um, respiratory illnesses in, particularly, in particular are very likely to climb as a result of climate change.
And finally, there's an economic price tag to all of these impacts. The cost to repair that damage from severe weather, rising health care costs, increased water and energy consumption, and the cost to just adapt, frankly, to these changing conditions and, and get our communities to be resilient. Experts have estimated a social cost of carbon, um, which really tries to quantify that fiscal impact of each ton of greenhouse gas emissions that humans produce. Now, this, of course, isn't an exact science, and uh, scientists agree that the figure shown here, the $42 per ton of GHG, is probably a big underestimation. But let's just play this out for our region. Um, if we're paying $42 per ton of greenhouse gases in repairs, adaptation, and more, and our county, Multnomah County, emitted 7.7 .7 million metric tons of greenhouse gases in 2017, what's the price tag? Well, that means we're footing a bill of about $323 million annually just from climate change, and that is only expected to rise. Now, despite all of that doom and gloom, um, our region is actually going to fare much better than a lot of the country where the impacts I just ran through are going to make it near impossible for many folks to live there long term. For example, in, in the Sun Belt, where temperatures could just really get unsustainable and, and water crises um, could, could get untenable. So the final impact I'm going to talk about today is increased migration. This map shows the expected change in GDP and population shifts due to climate migration. Overall, uh, as you see with the blue, you see the northern states benefiting from this growth as people leave the southern Sun Belt seeking water, seeking livable temperatures. But this increased population growth is going to exacerbate a lot of the costs that we talked about on the last slide. So keeping the picture of the impacts of climate change that we just walked through in mind, we also need to acknowledge that not everyone is equally vulnerable to all of those impacts. Communities of color, lower income populations, persons with disabilities and health risks, the elderly, these are all groups that because of uh, chronic inequities and underinvestment, systemic racism, and, and other factors, experience increased vulnerability, and they will be on the front lines of the climate crisis. These communities also contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions. So to be blunt, climate change is incredibly unfair. It places the burden most heavily on those who are the least to blame. And that's true in our community and globally. Climate change is also inherently intersected with the inequities and racist outcomes of planning and development overall. Decades of decision making have pushed Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as low income Portlanders, further out from the city center to places where transportation, green infrastructure, job opportunities, and more are less adequate. So this makes it even harder for these groups to weather the impacts of the climate crisis. Here's just one stat. Asthma rates in East Portland reach up to 25% compared to around, you know, between 3 and 10% in wider, more affluent neighborhoods in the city. In turn, the climate friendly investments we've been making like bike lanes and transit investments, solar and green energy projects, those to date have largely benefited more affluent and white people. And these people have been at the table when we talk about climate action much more than our BIPOC black indigenous people of color and marginalized community members. So we have to do things differently, which can be hard and slow in government, but we really can't wait. We have to tackle the climate crisis urgently, and we have to do so deliberately in a way that leads to more just outcomes that address the disproportionate harms of the past. Ooh, well, as I mentioned at the beginning, that was really heavy. Talking about this stuff is not easy, and it, it can really um, bring on feelings of, of fear and sadness and guilt and frustration. But, so let's pivot to what we're gonna do about it. We have a plan, right? Well, we do, and actually our region can be really proud that we've been um, pioneers in this area and adopted the first uh, carbon reduction strategy in 1991, first for the nation. And uh, our, our, carb, our climate action plans that have been updated periodically over the last couple decades um, have helped us make some real progress. So what you see in this chart is in the purple, the overall trend of emissions for uh, Multnomah County. And, and it's, it's largely a success story. After a peak in about 2000, we see a, a general decline, even while population and jobs um, have continued to grow. In our
But unfortunately, we're not making progress quickly enough. And meanwhile, the challenge or the crisis has only grown uh, greater and bigger. Uh, what you see in this graph is that the blue bars are kind of what was in purple on the last slide, the trend of actual emissions in Multnomah County uh, since 1990. So you see a bit of an increase and then a, a gradual decline and some plateauing in recent years. But recently the city adopted a goal of being net zero by 2050, which means we either reduce or offset all emissions. At the end of the year, our emissions uh, are at zero. Um, to get there, we would have to be decelerating or decreasing our, our carbon or greenhouse gas emissions at the rate that you see with that slope of that green arrow, which is just much faster than we've, we've been doing it. And when we zoom in on transportation, we see that's a particularly weak spot. We've been heading the wrong direction on transportation. This graph shows um, different sectors between 2000 and 2017 and how they've trended in terms of, of overall carbon dioxide emissions for our region. You see there transportation is up high because it represents the largest wedge. It's the largest um, portion or, or source of our emissions. And while most of the other lines, you see a downward trend, which is what we wanna see in transportation, you actually see it ticking up. We're emitting more emissions now than we were in 2000. And that's even as uh, our vehicles are getting more fuel efficient and individually, our individual transportation carbon footprints might be getting smaller. So why is that? Well, the truth is we're still just driving too much. As our region grows and more and more people are moving to and through the Portland area, we're still seeing a growth in vehicle miles traveled that leads to that upward trend line. Um, to move our people and our goods, we're gonna have to figure out a way to do that all more efficiently and bring down vehicle miles traveled or VMT if we're gonna tackle that transportation emissions part of the equation. So let's zoom in even deeper on the freight portion of that transportation piece of the puzzle. So globally, freight accounts for about 40% of worldwide transportation emissions. In the US, um, EPA estimates show it a little bit smaller portion. Medium and heavy duty trucks account for about 23% uh, of transportation emissions. Um, but per mile traveled, as you can see in the bar graph on the right, cargo trucks and buses in the US consume more fuel and produce more emissions than, um, than the same mile traveled by a, by a passenger vehicle or car. Another trend we're seeing is that demand for freight is increasing. Uh, the World Resources Institute estimates that demand is up 68% since 2000 when you look at um, kilometers traveled per, per ton of freight movement since 2000. Um, and that's a good thing. That means that, you know, more now than ever, uh, we, we, we are able to get the goods moving around our world that make our society and our economy hum. And we've seen during the, the COVID era, era how important that is. Um, but we also know that because of the, um, the, the impact on, on emissions and fuel use per mile traveled by freight, as you see in the bar graph, we need to, to do this smartly and, and do it in a way that it plays a positive role in that uh, story of reducing our transportation emissions. So what can we do about it? Well, literature around freight and climate suggests a three-part model, avoid, shift, and improve. So the avoid piece of the puzzle means reduce the amount of overall freight VMT or vehicle miles traveled through efficiency and curbing demand for that on-demand global shipping of goods shift uh, what's left on the road, let's make sure that is shifted to cleaner fuels and methods of transportation. So electric fuel, electric vehicles, or cleaner burning fuels, renewable diesel, for example, things that will make every mile traveled have a, have a lower um, impact on our carbon footprint. And finally, improve. This speaks to overall making the freight system operations, networks, et cetera, more efficient so that we're not importing, exporting, and transporting goods in a way that's, that's harmful or inefficient across our region, our country, and the globe. Now, this avoid, shift, and improve model is really similar to our broader climate strategy here in the city of Portland. Uh, and you can see on the screen, it has you know, three major steps underneath a, a climate justice umbrella. So the first step, whether we're talking about energy or transportation, food waste, water use, what have you, the first step is consume less. 
Um, so connecting that to those freight terms that I introduced on the last slide, that's where we would avoid the unnecessary freight VMT. The next step is we need to use cleaner energy. We need to green up the grid and then power our vehicles with that greener energy. In the freight terms, that would be the shift uh, part of the, the three-step process. And then finally, in terms of the improve, that's where we're talking at the city about planning and building sustainable communities where people can meet their needs uh, near home. They don't have to travel far to, to get food, to get the supplies they need. We're also talking about the adaptation of our overall system, of our transportation system. Um, we know that things like the impacts of climate change, heat, drought, flooding, all these things can impact our supply chains and impact our ability to move goods. And so being prepared for that and able to adapt is also part of improving um, the overall system and will, will lead to, to better climate outcomes. So what's the rush though? If we've got until 2050, we have 30 years to figure this out, right? Well, unfortunately, no. And I'll try to avoid getting really wonky and using complex science terms. But what this graph shows is that there's really an inertia in climate change. You see there where the emissions peak is. If we started cutting emissions tomorrow and really went totally the right direction, we would still see global temperatures rise. And that's because the gases that are stored in our atmosphere will continue to warm the earth um, and won't kind of overcorrect for a few, or won't correct back um, for a few years. And so that means we're, we're, we're probably gonna exceed the temperature target that we need to, but we can't exceed it by too much because then we might never get back to that, that uh, healthy and sustainable level. Well, we'll it'll take us past the point of no return. And what is that point of no return? Well, in complicated wonky science terms, it's 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which I know really doesn't sound like much. You know, what's 75 compared to 78 degrees? Well, even those tiny changes, they have really, really big impacts, as you can see from this chart on the right here. And the bleak news is that meeting that 1.5 degree target is really, really unlikely. Even two degrees, which as you can see in this chart would be much worse than 1.5 degrees Celsius, even that will take massive global shifts. And it'll take starting those immediately, thanks to that inertia that we talked about in the last slide. So even if you didn't quite track those complicated degree numbers and graphs in the last couple slides, here's the punchline. The next 10 years are crucial, so we don't overshoot that point of no return. Emissions have to peak now, so that when we get to the end of the decade, we're not too far gone. According to the International Panel on Climate Change, by 2030, our climate future will be sealed. So that's why projects like 2040 Freight are so important. Within the lifetime of this plan, we'll know if we've gone too far, if we're gonna go past that point of no return and not get back to a temperature target that is, that is livable for our planet. But let's end on some positive solution-oriented notes. <laughs> The climate crisis is indeed an existential threat and combating it is gonna require us to challenge many elements of our status quo, but we've always been trailblazers. And in the midst of a challenge, we seize opportunity. So through the bold transition it's gonna to take to combat the climate crisis, we can unleash a new era of advancement around social justice and equity, around innovation and technology, economic development and job creation will lead to better community health outcomes. And we can do it all while cutting costs and saving money because we'll avoid that the social cost of carbon that we looked at. So with that, I wanna thank you for listening to this presentation and thank you for your interest in the 2040 Freight Plan. Have a great day.